Hi, my name is Joe Palmer and I'm the founder and managing director of Pointer Remote. So we're a company that is passionate about supporting businesses and individuals from all over Australia, particularly in rural areas, to leverage remote work. So we support businesses to grow their teams and individuals to re-enter the workforce or to upskill in remote. We also work with communities themselves to support them to attract and retain population and to increase economic development in their area. Today, I'm joined by the fabulous Kate Kesby from Juggle Strategies, and I'm really excited about what things we get to talk about today. Kate, look, you can fill us in on what you guys do, and you can give me well, and the, the listeners, the overview of what you guys do, who you work with, and I'm really excited to jump in. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, so Juggle Strategies, we co-founded that in 2015, where flexible work was still really a special dispensation. And our mission was to really work with companies and get them to think differently about it, that it's it really should just be evolving ways of working to take advantage of more of the future work, future ways of working, if you like, to unlock different benefits in the business for everyone, not just for special interest groups, but to mainstream that flexibility. And we do that with consulting, with training, uh, with coaching to really try and shift mindsets and capabilities around flexible work. Mm. Are you finding yourself in one of those funny spots where you're like, um, I feel like I've been shouting into a void for a long time and now everyone's come to the party and they're, um, they're like, oh, all that stuff you've been talking about is it's actually, that really makes sense. And like, yeah, yeah. This. <laughs> it has been such a revelation uh, for most executives, I have to say, who really had in their mind that flexible, flexible work wasn't for them. It, they didn't need it. They didn't want it. There were particular parts of their workforce who would benefit from it. A lot of the time it was a branding exercise, not a lived experience. It was something all the best employers do, so we need to do it too, but they didn't really get it. And even the first few months of lockdown, I don't think they still did, you know, because it was this adrenaline fueled, we're just going to move everybody out. We're going to work exactly the same way we always have, but somewhere else. And slowly the light started to come on of, oh, actually, I, I do work at home and I can trust my people and productivity did not fall through the floor. And mm. th um, maybe this is a better way of working in a lot of ways and in others, you know, deeply missing some of the ways they used to work together. Yeah. Been fascinating. Yeah. So today we're really going to talk around like the fact that this is here now, this is not something like, the likes of juggle strategies, the likes of pointer remote have been talking and sort of banging on and the bashing anyone that will listen to yeah. um, that this is here and now, okay, what do we do with this? What now? So yeah. as far as um, like the organizations and companies and things that you work with, yeah. what are you seeing on the ground for the people that are really, that have like genuinely embraced, whether they did it from day one or whether yeah. they've sort of got with the program now, what does that look like? So I think what the, what the better employers are doing is recognizing that this is here to stay and that's a good thing. Uh, but also recognising that this has not been flexible work because what we've been missing is choice. And in a lot of cases, people have been trying to work from home while they're homeschooling or when they're sharing a flat with four other people or, you know, they don't, you know, they're working from their kitchen table. So now the shift is how can we give people more choice and more freedom and think about a hybrid future where the people who want to come into the office who work better in that environment for whatever reason can come in as much as they want to and I think in the earlier days we saw people trying to prescribe that we'll have a red team and a blue team and you'll be in two days and you'll be in three days and then you'll rotate and so few people actually came in uh, that they just made them purple teams you know the people that want to come in, come in, and that's really been 5 to 10% of their workforce anyway. So they're well able to stay under their capacity limits and other people are choosing to stay from home. So we're kind of seeing that solve where we're introducing choice, but not judgment. So mm -hmm. as soon as you introduce the choice for people to come in or not, that's where we're seeing some managers really struggle 
to accept the choices that others are making. That's really interesting on two parts. One, I'm surprised, maybe not surprised, but that number is interesting. I sort of thought that it would have been more like you, mm. that, that we're, we're going back into the office. But yeah, I don't know, that's interesting. And then you make a really interesting point about the management side of things. So do you yeah. think that um, there's an element that management, aspects of management, do you think that it is that they're feeling that their position could become obsolete or do you think that they're the control and the trust and all of those things that you can hide those lack of when you've got a, a team in the office but mm. when you don't sort of have your, your claws into them and you can't see bums on seats, do you think that that's the challenging part? I see the opposite, actually. So I think we're seeing managers redefine how they add value. And in the beginning, when they did this, they thought it was all about supervision and, you know, are my people really working? And, you know, that huge explosion in surveillance technology to make sure people are working. And we're just not hearing that anymore. We're hearing managers say, actually, this takes more effort from me. I have to be more prepared. I have to be more intentional, more deliberate. I have to reach out to my team. But I've become a better manager. So they've sort of realised that maybe they were assuming that people knew what to do and what the priorities were just by osmosis, by kind of being here. And they were assuming people were on track because they were physically sitting somewhere in the vicinity. And now they're realizing that's not necessarily the case. They're developing higher trust, more authentic, genuine relationships with people that they hadn't had before. So even though there's less travel to go and see people, there's less face-to-face, -face, we're finding managers say, actually, I've become a better leader and I'm more connected to them than ever before. But that comes at a cost for the manager of, you know, real intensity and effort. Yeah, that's so interesting. So do you think that, um, do you think that wellbeing is paying, playing more of a role in their positions now? Yeah, definitely. Particularly in areas like Victoria where they're in extended lockdown. Mentally, the burden of that has been immense, particularly when that announcement was made in the second lockdown that it was going to be another few weeks. The energy, it was just palpable how disheartening that was for people to have that loss of freedom. So I think managers are becoming far more aware of mental health indicators, but it's become completely normalised and mainstream to have that conversation. You know, the Are You OK Day sort of once a year. I think we've moved on to every day really checking in how are people feeling and it's become okay for people to say I'm just not feeling it today I just feel like I'm running through treacle I'm just getting nothing done I'm exhausted yeah that's so interesting that's so interesting and I guess then do you find that the sorts of things where normally you would be going I can only imagine that your pitch has changed like you used to be like okay this is what flexibility is now where everyone's <laughs> now living it and you're not having to sort of explain it anymore yeah. but you finding that the work that you're doing with organisations is spending more time with managers and helping them adjust their their management in a, in a lot more of a, a structured way? Um, I mean, it's really varied depending on how experienced they were, how set up they are with the tech, you know, all that sort of thing. If you've got businesses that always had, say, five offices around Australia and lots of businesses around the world, they, they actually kind of get it that they were working remotely it's just those people were in a different office mm. and what they've lost therefore is just there was another supervisor looking at them work and now they don't have that so they've the mindset shift around flexibility has been really really interesting and remote in particular so before companies would the big companies would really entertain 100% remote only if you had earned your trust you know maybe you were already with the organization you'd been there a long time and you wanted to move they'd make an exception for you or if, if they were thinking of moving whole teams, they were thinking Eng India, Bangladesh, Philippines. You know, they weren't thinking within the shores of Australia was where someone else can manage them. Mm. So the shift is now like, well, actually, I don't really need these geographic boundaries. A Sydney resource could support a Melbourne person. Melbourne doesn't really need to be in Melbourne. It could be in Geelong. Do I really need them to be within two hours of the city or can I untether them? And can I think more broadly around that? So... It's, they're thinking much more broadly around what are the outcomes we need to achieve 
what is the, the conversations we're having is to really think about if you want people to come back in or be tethered or near an office, what is that in service of? You know, why? Uh, why do you need that? And how can you solve for those in different ways, you know, ways that you've never would have thought about before, not just because everybody else is doing it and the world's moved on and you've got to keep up with the Joneses, but really think about what does this mean for you? What are the opportunities as well as the risks? Mm, that's interesting. So what do you think then are the challenges that you're seeing really, like the, the really overarching challenges that you're seeing with people move to that so that not we're keeping up with the we're not keeping up with the Joneses like genuine change mm. what are the what are the sort of challenges that they're up against is it that there's employee resistance is there management resistance is there like the, mm. you mentioned the tech like is it the infrastructure that are the challenges what's the what's the sort of roadblock to this becoming literally business as usual moving forward um Largely mindset now, you know, over the first three months, people really got their tech sorted. They just prioritised that, made it, made the investment available and did what they needed to do to get people laptops or, or they went into the office and took home their physical computers and screens and monitors and chairs. So they're kind of over that part now. And they're realising that it's not that work isn't going to get done. You know, they can trust their people. What they're struggling with is collaboration. And in their mind, collaboration still is we get people physically together in a room or I wheel my chair over to the person next to me and we like physically look at something together or talk it through. And they're not, they haven't been able to solve how else can we collaborate and bring our ideas and knowledge together in an informal way because people are just sick and tired of video screens. Um, not everyone's worked out things like shared whiteboards, or some of the other collaboration tools where you can put stickies up and write on things together. Um, I think they're only, most organisations are really now just experimenting with things like collaboration doesn't even have to be at the same time. You know, it can be asynchronous, which is just mind blowing. This is not how things are done. So it's early days, but they're solving for collaboration and they're solving for culture. So you know, how do I, if everyone's dispersed, how do I make sure we don't lose the essence of who we are and that everyone's really clear on what we stand for and how we work and what we believe in and feels that sense of belonging to an organisation when they're not, you know, in the coffee shop together. <clears throat> who pictures someone that's nailing it, like an organisation that you guys are working with that are nailing that culture piece? What does it look like? Uh, that what they're recognising is culture is not defined by a postcode. You know, it's um, what they're really good at is communicating a common purpose. So here's what we're all going for. This is what brings us together and unites us. We all have different roles to play in this, but this is, this is the why behind we're doing and, and what we're doing. And they're just really repeating that message. The behaviours they're highlighting rather than the tasks and celebrating that. So when you stop and think about culture is not defined by a physical building that you've made, but it's about the people, the choices they make, the way they engage each other, then you can highlight and clarify and communicate that all the time. And it can even be stronger than before. Yeah, interesting. That's some of the stuff that I suppose is a combination, like you say, when a manager feels like they are doing a better job than they had been previously, yeah. productivity is up, like that people are really feeling like, okay, I've got this work-life blend thing. Like I've got work is happening. My manager is like nailing it. Like we're really like, I'm, I'm just, and like, I know what the company's moving towards and things like that. Yeah. That's a, that's a, a, a good sign for a business. Um, as far as um, like, I, I guess when, when you sort of talk about communication and the culture pieces being sort of roadblocks and people are working out ways to do that, are you seeing hesitancy or hesitancy, hesitation or mm. resistance to business growth or growing their teams? Are they apprehensive about what recruitment looks like in as far as growing your team having not ever onboarded people like this, having never had people that are doing this, whether it's hybrid or flex or whatever, or if it's a fully remote thing, are you sort of, yeah. um, are, are any of your people you're working with and clients at that sort of stage at the moment? Yes, uh, but deeply uncomfortable about it. So the, their business realities are, I've 
I've got to keep growing. Um, I, I need to keep hiring people. And they kind of just paused all that for the first few months and then realized, all right, this is not a short term gig. This could be another year, 18 months. I have to keep operating the business. Um, but you can hear, you know, things like they'll say, you know, we've got people that are in the business now that we've never met and have never stepped foot in our office. And they're very uncomfortable about that. They're not uncomfortable that these people don't have the skills. You know, they've interviewed them, they've vetted them, they've checked references. It comes back, I think, more to the culture of um, how will they know who we are and how things are done around here. But it's not just the onboarding that we're hearing managers are uncomfortable about. It's also advancement. So... How do we find the right people? How do we onboard them? How do we give them that in, informal kind of walk the floors and meet everybody that's not in your team? But everybody that was here before as well that might be missing out on meeting senior leaders and um, how do we see, how do we identify high performers coming through the ranks and make sure that they're getting those opportunities to advance? So we have to rethink all of that. Mm. So what are some of them doing? What's the answers? What are, what, are, what are some things or stuff that you would love to see or that you're recommending that people are putting in place? As far as that, that career advancement and progression is like a challenge and has been pre-pandemic as far as yeah. Remote, that how, yeah. how are you seeing? So what are, what are some suggestions around that? Well, I think the first, the first thing we're really trying to coach and challenge our clients on is to recognise that that is a good thing. What it's done is actually exposed lazy practices before, that if you really were relying on walking the floor to overhear a conversation at random to identify someone who was a high performer, how many were you missing? And it was this kind of false meritocracy, um, all the unconscious biases that were coming through. If you have when you strip all of that away, what's left is genuinely, what is the work being contributed? What are the ideas? Um, how effective are people in their roles? How are they going above and beyond? And, and it's the, the facts of what's being delivered rather than who you run, run into or who else comes in early that morning or, you know, which are really not very good indicators that you might've been using before. But it is a process you know, it's been a bit confronting, but we're talking to clients that some of them have experienced grief, like really, because the change was so sudden and so complete. And this realisation once it sunk in that really as much as they might have preferred, they want to go back to the old ways, they just aren't there anymore. They're just never going to be there anymore. Mm -hmm. We've got execs that were going back in, even in lockdowns, they'd go in every day and they'd wear their suit and tie. And they'd sit in the office by themselves. Um, no one else was there. And they'd get really cross initially, like, where is everyone? Why aren't they here? And if they're prepared to go to the pub and the cafe, then, you know, they're really just taking the mickey out of us. They should be here. Uh, and you sort of saw that whole journey wash out that, that they're not going to come back in the way that they used to. You know, it's not going to be 90% of people are in the office 90% of the time, really ever again. Mm. And it's interesting, that's interesting, the word grief around it, because you're right, that's, that's a, it's almost grieving for time gone and generation yeah. and a, a way of life gone and what that looks like yeah. forward. Yeah, really. For some people, you know, they had a corner office they worked hard for. If, if they were very senior, people would respond to them in a particular way when they walked in. They had that executive presence in a big room of people. They used to travel all the time and they loved, some of them loved that. Others are not missing that um, at all. But the way, the way that they got to where they are, what made them successful, just isn't there anymore and probably never will be. And they hadn't yet replaced, what does, what does this look like for me in the future? So they really did have to go through a process of grief for the life that was before they could start to really think about what's ahead and how do I intentionally design to keep what, what still works from the old way and keep what we've learned through this new COVID disruption and design something that's fit for purpose and, and fit for our culture and fit for our clients. Mm, so interesting. And I suppose it's interesting for people that are sort of at that senior level of career. What about at the, the opposite end of that? If someone is a new grad, like what does, what does that mean for say like, I don't know if you deal with say a big accounting firms or someone else that takes in grads or interns and those sorts of things, like how mm. is that end of business looking for organisations? Yep. You've got to, 
you've got to ask. You know, you can't wait for someone to walk past and notice you. You've actually got to go and build that network and build that community. If you're new to an organisation or junior and you're trying to broaden your network and experience, you've got to be the one that actually really sticks your hand up and says, can I sit in and observe that meeting? That's actually easier than ever before because you can just share a dial in and get someone to sit on, you know, turn the video off, go on mute, just literally be a fly on the wall. So the capacity is there for you if you just ask. Um, so be intentional okay. about what you want to learn and who you want to meet and who you want to observe and you can make it happen, but in new ways. Yeah, that's really interesting. And you're right. That's almost like an all access pass for, and not just for juniors or interns or whatever, no. but throughout your business. I guess, Absolutely. Um, yeah, is that, is that sort of something that you've seen um, over time or even just in this more dramatic, shorter period of time, yeah. is that are people taking advantage of that ability to be able to do stuff across teams? Like, are you sort of seeing that, or are people not quite there yet? They're like, okay, let's get our own house in order and then we can start looking across? They're not quite yet. They're not quite there yet. So we're seeing um, manager to direct report getting stronger than ever. Uh, teams actually having a stronger bond where you've got a manager that can feel, facilitate that conversation around new frameworks, new ways of working, new commitments to each other. Um, but the cross team uh, has probably got worse in most organisations that we're becoming a bit more siloed and those uh, informal crossing of cross-functional things are harder. Yeah, that's interesting because I guess in, um, and I guess those challenges just become larger and larger, if the bigger the business as well, that like where it would have been quite solid in a, in a say a large corporate pre this and yes. then now what that looks like. I guess um, as far as that, with that in mind, like what's the sort of suggestions or the strategy strategies around that sort of cross pollination of, of, teams and things for you guys like what sort of advice do you give around that to support that sort of stuff in this flexible way so I think in the same way that you know I know you might have co-located cross-functional people in a pod sitting together um, you can do that with say a slack channel um, so you can still have that almost observing incidental kind of I'm aware of what you're doing without being necessarily in it uh, in just a virtual sense through some of those Teams channels, Slack channels, those sorts of things. Uh, we just need to, all of this is solvable. We just need to think through what am I actually trying to achieve? What is that in service of? And, mm -hmm. and what's a different way for us to approach achieving that? And really the organisations that are doing that well are asking their people. So you go to the people and you say, here's what we're observing. How might we solve that? And they're much closer to the brass tacks of what tools they have, what time they have, how they actually work, what they really need each other for. And they can come up with some of those, I need this every day versus every second week is, is good. Yeah. And I guess what, what do you see then is the role of, of HR looking like? Have you seen that that sort of has evolved, will evolve, will need to further evolve? And I guess going back into that cross team sort of thing, like I, I guess... Yeah. To, this ball like who owns this does senior leadership own this who where does this sit yes i mean the business owns this and i think they always have in a in a leadership sense but hr's role i think has changed really rapidly and hats off to anyone out there in hr that's listening to this the hours they worked in the first couple of months, the lengths they went to to care for their people and make sure everyone was supported and safe. It was unbelievable, uh, the sort of effort that, that they put in. And then, you know, it went through all these build back better and return to work plans and, and uh, many of them have just been shelved. You know, they've just been able to keep their energy up and keep, uh, keep trying and iterating and experimenting it's been a phenomenal effort for everyone in HR. So they are having to reimagine how they support people, how they foster that culture, how, what, what are the manager capabilities and leader capabilities they actually want to be recruiting for, developing and, and highlighting and promoting, um, how they support leaders to actually, you know, to set the strategy and communicate it. And you know, I think it's becoming less transactional and more transformational and it's a scary process when you're saying distribute information and uh, let people make their own 
rules and it's going to look different in every part of the business and how do we deal with grievances and discrepancies when there's no one set formula you know you're really relying on managers at the ground level and therefore you, you know the hr people have to be very good at setting clear expectations of what good looks like in this organization and supporting managers to kind of play in the gray to make their own decisions but with some very clear guardrails frameworks principles and sets of behaviors uh, that, that they can work within mm, that sounds like an incredibly tough job <laughs> yeah I, I guess um then you touched there like as far as that just sort of looping it back around again to that that, that growing team what do you think that as far as like this new world order and what this this looks like Mm. When organisations are growing, what do you reckon the top sort of like two or three core skills in an individual, do you think, to, regardless of sort of industry and position and those sorts of things, what do you think are really the key attributes that organisations need to be looking for in people that are going to be joining their team in a less than, well, maybe possibly disrupted, but different to how they had previously and will be working differently? Like what are the sorts of, of personal attributes, the soft skills, what sorts of things are you, are you thinking mm. that people are looking for? So one is self-awareness. Um, and that is, you know, really knowing when you do your best work, what conditions you do your best work in and, um, you know, being able to proactively create those conditions to proactively go and communicate to people about what you're doing and what you need and how you want to work with them. Um, yeah, so self-awareness and really strong proactive communication skills is one. And an emerging skill, I guess, of importance, managers used to worry that, you know, people won't really work. What we have learned is we never needed the air quotes. What's happened is people work way too much, way too much. So another skill is actually boundary setting that you know I, if, if my manager has done a good job of give, being clear with me about what's expected and how much is enough in a knowledge kind of based role that that I have the confidence to be able to set a boundary not say yes to everything not be on 24 7 not be on meetings across time zones or whatever it is but set some boundaries and have that intense period of work a rest and a recharge you know, kind of time to balance and make it more sustainable because we are seeing burnout being an issue. Mm. And I guess as well that, yes, having boundaries yourself, but being able to articulate and almost manage up with these are my boundaries and not just saying yes, but actually saying no or, or yeah, yeah. articulating those boundaries because I think that's a lot of the, the people that we see and deal with it that are talking around that stuff is that you're right that burnout is real and that the good intentions are there but I think some organizations are almost like oh my gosh this is like all our Christmases have come at once we're getting not only yeah. like reducing overheads with not less people doing travel like look at not only are they more like not even like, like are they they're getting their job done and some Yes. But it's almost they would be tentative to sort of be assisting with the boundaries because yeah. the output is happening. Yeah. And I think there's, there's a lot of job insecurity because the economic conditions are so bad. Um, but I think it's not a good strategy if you say, well, you, you know, in, in metro areas, people may be commuted 40 minutes to an hour each way. Some companies are trying to take that time. And some people are, you know, saying, well, I'll start work earlier and I'll finish work later because I'm not having that commute. Others are saying, um, that's your time, you know, and go for a run in that time or walk the dog or learn a language, you know, do whatever hobby you have and be more productive in the time that you would have been working with us. Don't just fill all of that commute time with work. So there's mm -hmm. got to be a balance in there for the longer term. Okay. Creativity, you know, burnout will cost creativity. Yeah. A hundred percent. Well, and it will also, you will lose staff. That's going, you're going to yeah. churn staff. Um, I think that's a really interesting point that you say, like that talking about the actual commute time, because realistically, it's not as if that was leisure time because we are so connected quite often that the, the employer was already getting those extended work hours in a, 
a metro commute that there aren't people yes. on their phone. They can still take calls. They can. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Interesting. I guess I wanted to um, today be really like um, you guys are a wealth of, of knowledge and uh, advice and experience and things for, for businesses that are in this transition thing. Like that's always been your, your sweet spot is that you've been, that change yeah. management and assisting that, that to happen. Yeah. For businesses of any size, what do you think would be, say, three really, like, gold nuggets pieces of advice that, mm. like, you're going to embrace this and you're taking bull by the horns and you are mm. going to, to make this work and make flexibility or remote or a hybridness as part of not only how you do business as usual but it becomes then part of your company values as around flexibility um it becomes something that you use to not only retain your talent but attract new talent into it into your business yeah what do you think like three pieces of advice moving forward like this is here it's not going away Mm -hmm. you've done your grieving on what it was like before yeah. What, are your, what are your three pieces of advice for, to really like nail this moving forward, do you think? Well, I think the biggest one is to really challenge yourselves to think about why and really intentionally design ways of working that will underpin your strategy. And so that's going to look different for every organisation. There's no kind of magic formula of like you're 60% this and 70% that. It's about who are you as a business? What are the outcomes you have to achieve? How do you reach your, your market, your suppliers, your customers, your partners? What are the skills that we need and what are the ways we need to work to underpin that? Because it's, if your reason that you're building this foundation in it is everybody else is doing it and my employees are going to want it, it's just a glorified pool table. You really have to have the leadership of this business authentically standing behind these ways of working saying actually this is the this is how we're going to be effective and resilient and come out the other end of this stronger because it ties directly to ways of working underpinning our strategy and and that's just a conversation um, and and in that conversation to have you know challenge each other is that just the way we've always done things is that just what we know what else might be true what else might be possible what if how might we and just really try and peel back set aside anything that's based on everyone else is doing it or our people expect it you've got to dig deeper to something more substantial underneath that so that's that's the big one the second one is start with trust because this just doesn't work uh, if you're not having trust and that's regardless of if it's if you are hybrid if you're remote if you're in the office because once you have a uh, choice you have judgment you know if you don't have that trust you've got people judging each other for the choices that they're making and making assumptions about whether people are being fair or committed or loyal or effective uh, you have to do rigorous uh, recruitment but once they have passed that hurdle and even a probation period if you do that you're starting with trust now and you're not judging each other for the choices that you're making, but you're going to give people the benefit of the doubt that they're going to do what they say they're going to do and their, their, their intentions are to do the best job that they can. There'll always be a small percentage that, that you need to deal with. Always has been, always will be. Deal with them. Don't let them ride. Um, and the third thing is to be able to define effectiveness rather than productivity. And be really clear with, with their people on what's expected of them, not in a bunch of tasks that need to be achieved, but it's bigger than that when it's a longer term issue. Like, what do we want you to contribute to the organisation in terms of what we want you to learn? Who, who's going to learn from you? How do you contribute to the energy and the buzz of the culture? Not just you doing your job, but, but between teams. So, yeah, those would be my three places to start. So good, so good. And something that I suppose I just wanted to sort of round this out with that we haven't really touched on a whole lot, but you mentioned sort of right at the start that you guys have always looked at flexibility not around minority groups or, or parts yeah. of the population so that it's not flexibility is not a women thing, it's not a mother thing, it's yeah. not 
a, um, a, a thing for specific groups. What do you think is the biggest, um, I suppose, thing for businesses to get their head around is that, like, how do you encourage not only your current staff to consider this flexibility moving forward as something that is actually appropriate for them, that, that oh, this is talking to me, this is no longer just a thing for other people? Mm. And what does it mean then when you use that like idea around like growing your team and hiring and what diversity that brings into it like what what sort of advice do you have around that sort of transitioning to because that's some pretty big mindsets changing stuff that needs to happen there as that's well. it it's a mindset it's a mindset shift and when we hear organizations talking about that oh we want to increase our women so we're going to bring in flexibility um we know that their mindset is win lose so I will make a, I will compensate you for this. I will make a concession for you to offer you this perk because I want this particular outcome, but I feel like I'm losing something in the business in return. And, and it fails as soon as you have a win lose mindset because you get people then that are fearful to take it or that if they really want it or need it, they sort of have to come cap in hand begging and you get these leader lotteries where one manager will and one won't just because of their personal preferences. So the mindset shift, this is why that first one was understand why, um, is you need the business and all the leaders in the business to understand that it's good for business. You know, if we can create an environment where people can do their best work and maybe that's the time of day that they're working, maybe it's the environment they're working in, you know, less interruptions, more interruptions, people have deep work or collaboration, but it's really about if your brain is your tool of trade, how do you get the most out of that brain and that brain capacity? We know it's about autonomy. We know it's about the flexibility for people to choose when they do their best work and create their day in order to deliver the best productivity in a sustainable way. So you've got to deal with that mindset of win-lose. And Once you get people to recognise this is actually not a concession it's just smart business then uh, new things become possible mm, that's so true yeah oh, it's Kate so many goodies so many goodies um look where can people find you juggle strategies where can people get in touch give us the, yep the run. um so probably the best place is our LinkedIn page where we're regularly having conversations or posting things of interest and things that uh the business community are, are dealing with and and experimenting with so find us on linkedin juggle strategies and reach out if you want to get in touch great well i can vouch for your your linkedin game is strong i'm quite <laughs> regularly um, finding uh fabulous articles and things that you guys have written yourselves but also that you're sharing from a uh, very much a, a global um, view on flexibility and what that looks like moving forward. Thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Welcome. Thanks so much for having me. It's always fun to have a chat. Anytime.